My heart, um, it's going to be on Civilization 3. Um, one of the game series that, that drew me to educational technology and eventually into this, into this field. We have the really uh, rare and unique opportunity, I, I, I wouldn't be exaggerating and say this is something of a dream panel for me, um, bringing together people from very different walks of life who are interested in using civilization uh, for learning both inside of classrooms, outside of classrooms, looking at civ as a, as a cultural kind of artifact and so on. So in the panel um, we'll have again f uh, four different participants starting with Deb Briggs from Firaxis who is I always keep botching your actual title. You're Vice President of Marketing, is that no, correct? I no? Wish I oh, you wish. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> Director of Marketing. Um, is Jeff is still out there also in the crowd. We actually have the lead designer of Civ3 and the president, founder, and CEO of Firaxis, so we can also hopefully get him in involved at some point. Um, then we have Pat Seed, who's a historian at Rice, who just moved on to Cal Irvine, is that correct? And he was one of the people who actually gave me the confidence doing my dissertation to run out and, and try something as wacky as using Civ in a classroom. So um, it's great to have a world historian here who has some real, real deep disciplinary expertise in this area. And then Jeremiah McCall, who I just met through um, maybe the last week or two from one of Jim G's students. Uh, kids goes to his school in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati um, County Day School, is that right? Country, country, county, country. Cincinnati Country Day School, who has a really unique class um, having students build simulations, kind of paper-based simulations, but part of what they do is they play civilization as a way to get a better context for what simulations are, what they aren't, what, what they aren't, what they include, what they exclude, and so on. So um, all four of us will give a presentation that we're gonna try to keep under 10 minutes. We'll have a good 20 minutes for, for discussion. Um, I might cut mine out, depending on how we're doing on time, because I've, I've um, talked a lot about civ already in front of a lot of these people. So if you're ready, Deb, we will we will pass the baton. Great. So Deb, oh, you can use the desk, or if you want, well, is this working? No. Try it again. Is this working? Hello. Ah. Am I supposed to pick it up? Possibly. No. Okay. It's a fixed mic, but he told me to stand, so I'm a little confused. <laughs> oh, good. Alrighty, so here I am, Deborah Briggs from Paraxis Games. Um I'm a director of marketing and business development program at Paraxis. I have a background in education. Um, not a gamer, but uh, married to one. You know what that's about, right? <laughs> so I know a lot about games. Anyway, um, okay, so um, I call my presentation Global Civilization, and it looks really important up there on the big screen. It's not that important, but anyway, um, it's a pleasure to uh, be first today and sort of introduce my colleagues here who have been using our tremendous game in the classroom and um, appreciate being here. In the beginning, um, I know we all think that, uh, well, I've worked in education, so I know I always think that the great ideas are my own, but actually went on the web and uh, first mention of chess in America, 1600s. First mention of games that teach, 1700s. That's Cornell University that has that on their website. Uh, 1957, these are sort of important events, I think, in, in contemporary society that lead us toward the most important thing, the birth of the game civilization. Um, Sputnik, 1957. And I remember when I uh, was at Columbia doing my graduate work, really learning about Sputnik and the way that really changed everything. And I, I think that really was the impetus for um, obviously turning toward math and science, and that's where these games begin. Avalon Hill, 1958, the year of my birth. Very important year. Um, the other important thing in 1958, Avalon Hill, because you know the first games really were board games put on the screen. 1967, IBM floppy disks. And I have Atari down in 72 because really, I, it was 10 full years later that Microprose was founded in uh, Hunt Valley, Maryland by Sid Meier and Bill Staley. Um, and that's, that's a true story about how the company was founded. A couple guys out playing a, a game and daring each other that they could make a better game. Um, but here are some of the things about Microprose and how the legacy of our brands was birthed. Um, really taking those board games to screen. Uh, seeding an industry development model that we at Firaxis continue to pursue. It's an iterative model. And it's where the process of making the game feeds um, the gameplay and the development of the product. Um, at Microprose, they mentored the industry's best and brightest. And you'll find those people all over the country at all the independent game development houses, all the major companies. A lot of them started at Microprose because there were 350 um, people working there at the height of that company. And all of the companies that started in Hunt Valley were seated at Microprose. We call ourselves in that area the Silicon Valley of the East. <laughs> no joke. 
Uh, and of course, we birthed civilization at Microprose. In 1991, and you know, the, it's a true story that the marketers there um, did not think it would be a successful game and projected it would sell probably 30,000 copies. And they were wrong. <laughs> this is the Microprose legacy. Um, Firaxis is lucky enough to own a lot of that IP. We don't own quite all of it. Uh, but that gives you an idea of what Microprose was to the game industry as we know it and how remarkable Sid Meier's legacy is to the industry. You know, being so far away from it now, and even I've been his friend for 16 years, but about a year ago I went and did some research to really just remind myself, um, primary research, remind myself what it would be like for someone to develop pirates, civilization, and railroad tycoon in three years. And those are all new genres. Um, and somebody said earlier today if... Um, they wouldn't have thought of a game like Civilization if somebody hadn't made it, and Sid was able to do that. That's, that's his greatness, really. What, is a le what does it mean, legacy? And I was thinking as I was preparing this presentation, we think of it in terms of the IP, but you know, really it's at least three different things. It's the talent, the people that go into making, having a great idea, the ideas they have, and the IP itself. It's an, en it's an entity that we all know, for better or for worse, exists outside of yourself once it's done. And uh, that's the good news and the bad news because sometimes we get separated from the ideas we've created. And um, the interesting thing about civilization is that in terms of the talent piece, um, for Axis Games, the people there have always made the game civilization. They've made the most successful iterations of the game. There have been times that we've been separated from the IP and uh, I guess we're proud to say that those it hasn't worked out well for the IP, which does teach us all that um, somebody can buy your ideas, but they can't buy you or recreate you. Um, for Axis is 60 plus developers in Hunt Valley. We're 10 years old, almost 10 years old. And we've made nine games um, in 10 years. Um, these are a couple quotes, some brag quotes, but we're proud of them because um, the second one in particular, because at a time when the industry is really struggling the quality of life issues are very prominent in the industry. Um, we have a company where uh, we, I think in 10 years, I think only four or five people have left or been asked to leave in all that time. We hire people and mentor them. They become part of our team and um, share a tremendous amount of our profits with them because we believe that um, we all have contributed to making the product and it's because of that synergy and that collaboration that our products work. The iterative process works because who? Because of the people that work on them. Sid Meier's Civilization. It's just a little overview of the brand. I created in 1991. It sold a million copies, and it was the first mega, mega hit computer strategy game. Civilization II, two, two million units sold. Um, Civilization III continues to sell. It's sold more than three million units already. And we have a strong base in, in your community, and that's why we're pleased to be present today. It really was a thrill a couple of years ago when I came to one of these conferences and everyone was talking about the game, and I came back to the office and told everybody about it. Uh, we've been getting our own letters from people and, you know, um, testimonial letters about, you know, how much they love the game, how it changed their life, but we really had no idea the extent to which educators uh, were appreciating the deeper layers of the game and its capacity. Uh, we were calling it stealth education, not because we didn't feel it was um, um, an intentional or dynamic learning process for the player, just because we didn't intend to make a, a teaching game. Um, but we ended up making something that had inspired people. Very exciting. Civilization IV is coming out soon, and um, we have a lot of exciting plans for the brand. We have a new publishing partner. That's 2K Games, which is a sub subsidiary of Take-Two. They're a tremendous partner that shares our vision for meeting every audience with the brand, including the educational audience. And so we um, are forging new relationships with your community to try to find the best ways to bridge those relationships. A little more about civilization. You, you guys know all this. Um, the addictive fun, endless replayability, deep and accessible and all that stuff. Uh, we we uh, welcome you to, to uh, come to, if, if you guys are staying for E3, we have a hilarious um, trailer for Civ 4 that focuses on the addictive qualities of the game. It's a tongue-in-cheek thing about, um, our is, it, is, it, is it good that games are addictive? We've really taken off on that. 
and uh, so we're showing every half hour on the on the, on the hour every hour on the hour maybe um, okay moving ahead what to expect from the brand um, Civ 3 we um, as you might have read in the media um, 2K Games has acquired the rights to the Civilization IP, and in July they'll be re-releasing Civilization 3 Complete. Um, we intend to keep that on the market even as we release Civ 4. One of the reasons is, is that that is the game, the iteration that's been embraced by the educational markets. We know that schools are not geared up necessarily to play Civ 4 immediately, and so we're going to keep that on the market and um, provide full support for that game. We have a mobile game coming out, um, and actually imminently, but it'll be re-released by Take Two, 2K with us in July. Uh, it's our first effort to put Civ Civilization on the mobile platform. Civ 4, coming out. And here we go, this is all I'm gonna say about the content. We use a model which I think is pretty interesting. Um, in working with Kurt, I think we've been able to talk with, just to realize that the concept we use for game development is very similar to good educational con concept or a good educational framework. You know, when you're teaching, you always want to move from knowns to unknowns. You know, when you present something nobody knows that's totally new to somebody, they have no idea what you're talking about. So this is exactly what we do with our games. Um, use something that's proven, something that's known, uh, provide a bridge, and, and provide a bridge to what will be new. And there you have it right there. We're moving from knowns to unknowns, and that's how we're presenting new ideas in the game. And you know that's because we have core audiences that are always looking for a certain something in the game, and we have audiences always looking for a certain something more, and we want to try to please as many people as we can. Why civilization and learning? I was thinking about um, how in one slide to encapsulate this for you because um, there's so many ways to talk about it, including reading so many of the testimonial letters. But this is a quote from the book, The Courage to Teach. And um, I read it yesterday, and it's talking about teaching children about Rosa Parks. And so, you know, it talked about you could tell them what happened, you know, but if you were just to tell them, how would they know what it was like when she made the decision? And so it says, when great moments in history are reconstructed with the intentionality that comes only with hindsight, we forget the lone individual in the moment of decision, of her decision, and the anxiety or doubt she may have felt. And when we forget that, we forget our own power. And I just thought that is a great way of describing what people tell me is the reason they become addicted to the game and why their students get so much out of it. When you get a chance to be the decision maker. And then of course the, the transference there is when learners get a chance to decide for themselves how, they're, how they will proceed, that's when the empowerment comes and they propel themselves toward higher learning. Um, you know, we get letters from people that say, you know, then I went and bought a book and then I went, then I took a class on history and then a lot of letters from people like Kurt that say, and then I became a history teacher and now a games researcher. So, um, but on the bottom there I have a quote from Sid Meier, great games are a series of interesting decisions, which is really a game maker's way of saying the same thing. It's, you know, it takes you into a flow state, a feeling of empowerment to be the decision maker. And here we have Kurt Squire. Um, why is civilization powerful education? You know, we, we agree with the statement. We think that virtual worlds are powerful contexts for learning. Uh, we think our job is to make a fun game. Um, and we think, you know, we just want to find ways to engage in this new world um, and to try to make change in the educational framework and to see that our product uh, does all those things it can do to, to facilitate what the goals that you guys have. So, sort of to address your interests and our interests to meet the marketplace, uh, Firaxis is creating, is enriching an area on our website which we call Teacher Features. It's an area that we launched just a couple months ago and we actually featured Kurt as our first educator on there because of his work with civilization. But we plan to feature educators that use our games, uh, educators that are writing about uh, interactive education. Um, it's really fulfilling, you know, to find out how we've reached so many people who are having fun and learning and feel like they're becoming better people. So we want to invite you after the 15th of June uh, to write us, come to that space on our website and become part of um, an invited community to participate sort of as ambassadors for the movement and to help us decide how best to brand our game and to reach you most effectively. Thank you. Go ahead, Mrs.
Um, we're going to switch. I guess while we're waiting, um, I may as well explain that I'm actually a uh, history teacher, and um, so that, and I teach at the university level. And I've actually been using games for about uh, 10 years now uh, in the classroom. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of things about teaching games at the university level and what distinguishes them from using games in the elementary, middle, and high school levels. Um, and also wanted to um, say a little bit about why it was that I got into uh, using games. Um, before they get the, the <laughs> well, people work on this. There we go. Um, this is actually uh, an example. This is, and I couldn't find the, the syllabus that Kurt wanted me to show. It's on a computer that, whose motherboard I fried. Um, and what it was is that I was teaching the history of the European expansion. Uh, and this is at a, you know, elite private university. Um, and one of the things that unfortunately happens <laughs> um, yeah, I am plugged in with all of this is that the students felt that they knew already what happened. They knew uh, Vasco da Gama, they knew Bartholomew Diaz, but they had no idea um, as to any understanding of how difficult all of this was or how hard it was for people actually to sail um, the South Atlantic and to actually uh, achieve the goal of reaching uh, India. And so the reason why I started with this, and this is one of um, several courses where I began actually introducing games, is because I wasn't happy with texts that presented students with fait accompli. I mean, history is, most of it is 2020 hindsight. Um, it's, being, it's explaining things that should have happened the way they did happen. Um, and I wanted to have students have, as Deborah was talking about, just a minute ago, the opportunity to make decisions and to think about what was happening uh, in history. And so what I, what I began with, and this is, this is, I guess, about eight years ago, um, you know, using a game called sailing um, to try to get students to realize how difficult learning to sail actually was. Um, and then I introduced geographic information software. Um, I had some texts, and then I wanted to have them uh, understand how difficult it was. Once you passed um, the equator, you have an entirely different set of constellations. And so I wanted them to have the experience of actually looking at us, not giving them any information in advance, but giving them the idea, now you've got to figure out what stars you're going to use to navigate with. And I found that to be an absolutely marvelous experience because, in fact, two students came up with the Southern Cross, which is what the Portuguese came up with, but a lot of them came up with other stars as well. Um, and so for that, I used a variety of different um, uh, astronomy programs and even had a student that wrote uh, an open source uh, astronomy program um, for this class. Um, then I had them use Admiral um, to have the experience of what it was like to actually command a fleet. Um, then the Age of Sail and the Age of Revolution just simply to get an idea because a lot of um, the games didn't do naval battles particularly well. Uh, and since I'm somebody who cares very deeply about naval battles, um, <laughs> I wasn't very happy with this one, but at any rate. Um, and then I used a, an online um, thing called the, electro the Electric Astrolabe, so students could actually learn how to manipulate the electronic version of um, the first nautical astrolabe, which I argue, of course, is the first scientific instrument. Um, and so this is how I got into it. In other words, it was a series of courses that I was teaching, like this one, where I wanted to have the students be more involved in thinking about it and thinking about other options that could have been made that they might have made had they been uh, in that situation. And that led me, of course, to teach a history course, and this is actually behind a firewall uh, at Rice University, and it's password protected. Um, I think that's, uh, that's mostly to keep the uh, parents' complaints away. Um, and it's called World History Through Games. It's how most people learn, so why not make it official? Uh, um, 
And, you know, a little thing because I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of engineering students, the pictures of Mars from NASA come to you by way of 3D game software so that it's, you know, there's science at it. Um, and then sort of an introduction to games. And what I did in this course um, was actually I have a colleague who is a great board gamer. Um, and he's male and a dean of engineering. And I'm female, and I'm bored silly by board games, um, and I like the computer stuff. So it was, a, it was great for the students because they got the role models and the genders reversed right in the classroom from the very beginning. Um, and so um, we used a variety of different um, games, and, and we used some uh, board games that were very useful. Uh, German board com big game companies are terrific at producing historical games that are, I would say, in the last three years or so have been, uh, you know, have met standards of historical accuracy that even people writing history books don't meet. So um, they're really astonishing. So some of these, uh, Traders of Genoa, Ser uh, Princes of Florence, Merchants of Amsterdam, um, Aunt Decker, the VOC, etc. Um, but um, if you want to teach students about world history, um, you have very few choices. There are there's a world history AP test that a lot of people teach to. I'm I'm one of its major opponents um, because I find that the course is basically European civilization with a couple of other things thrown in, only in a little bit of China, a little bit of Japan, um, and the reason why I prefer to use civilization as an introduction is that it cuts a much broader cross-cultural swath of history than do the texts that are characteristically assigned to teach world history. Um, and so, um, at any rate, that's part of the reason why I like civilization. Uh, I also do use Age of Empires, sorry. Um, it also, because it also, it also does uh, similar kinds of things. Uh, it has a basically, AOE has a basically military and technology uh, narrative explanation. Um, this is better because it's got diplomatic and cultural in addition to the military and technology uh, narratives. A um, couple of things just to mention briefly, um, the reason, the other reason why I got interested in civilization is that I became fascinated with the game Colonization, uh, which is one of um, your early, yeah, the early games. Oh, was it Jeff's? Jeff oh, okay. There's the designer right there. Uh, so I'm giving Sid Meier credit where he Brits not do. All right. What I liked about that game was that it involved a kind of comparative approach to history that I thought was absolutely on target. In other words, what it presented you with the idea that there's not this amorphous thing called Europe. There are entirely different cultures of colonization. Um, there's the French culture, which colonization rightly points out is greatly involved in Canada at any rate, with making alliances with the natives, and that's the way, one of the ways, and it, it succeeds. The Spanish colonization of the New World works by military conquest and forced Christianization. Um, the Dutch work by trade, and so that out of this, you actually got an excellent sort of comparative understanding of the ways in which Europeans colonize the New World. Now, I happen, I happen to have written, just before this book, this came out, a book which is actually uh, on that subject called Ceremonies of Possession in Europe's Conquest of the New World, which is exactly about the English, French, Spanish, I had the Portuguese uh, and the Dutch in the New World. So I would, thought it was absolutely remarkable that a game designer was thinking along the same lines that I was. Um, I thought that was wonderful. Um, and let's see. So I think that one of the things that I would like to stress, and this is simply because I've heard some wonderful things so far today about learning and learning strategies and what kinds of things games can teach and, and how they can teach, is that um, 
one of the things that games, in fact, do is they require people to think, at least the game designers, to think comparatively because there are two separate processes involved, one of which is finding themes that are in common by multiple, held in common by multiple civilizations, but then also finding out how these different civilizations articulate those themes differently. And that, I think, is actually the more difficult thing to, you, to learn, that students very easily will be able to learn um, similarities. Similarities are what people, they immediately glob onto. Um, there's this whole tradition of using analogies in the history classroom. I always hated that. You know, that you, you were supposed to think that this was just like the other thing. Wrong. It's not like. It's another language. It's a different approach. It's a different understanding. Um, and so that in the process of developing games, you're actually introducing a kind of cross-cultural thinking and a process of making cross-cultural comparisons that I think is actually immensely useful. Um, I'm just going to end there, so. Sure, why not? <laughs> Sorry, minor te technical difficulties. See how much more convenient that was? That's fine. It's something that I think is um, really important to um, my approach to using Civilization III. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think I might be the only high school teacher that I've heard speak so far. So let me speak for sort of everybody from high school on down and, and say that um, there are many of us who are very meaningful about what we do and, and, and know what we're about and are not crushed by the weight of uh, standardized tests or anything like that and are trying to use games in a meaningful context. Um, the, way, the way I... Uh, approach the use of a game like Civilization 3 comes from my background, um, which I always share. Um, I don't know if it'll make sense to you or not, but it's, it was critical for me. Um, I got a PhD in, in Greco-Roman history at Ohio State University. Um, I don't know if any of you know anybody who's an ancient historian by training. Uh, we're a little weird. Uh, one of the things that's important for us is, is uh, an absolute, f <laughs> that's amazing. Keep talking. It's your machine. So, <laughs> this is great. This is like stand-up. So one of the things that's really critical to me anyways is that, that what I learned about history through my training is that it's not uh, an ivory tower exercise where you sit and contemplate the philosophy of life. Uh, history for historians is looking at primary sources and constructing meaning out of those sources. It's a very active dialogue with the past. It requires a lot of thought. It requires a lot of discussion. It's never, ever, ever accurate. Okay, it's always revised. Um, and, and so I guess as I define it, I mean, I think all uh, disciplines in education try to represent reality. I think the historian's role is to try and represent the, rea uh, the reality of the past um, through critical research. So, shall I keep going on my shtick? All right, so, <laughs> for me, it's essential that my kids in high school learn that history is a meaningful reconstruction of the past, um, that it is not something they learn and accept as rote, uh, that they don't simply regurgitate what comes from a textbook. In fact, I don't really have much use for textbooks at all. Um, I'm very interested with them understanding that sources disagree, that, that bias is a real thing in forming the past, um, and I'm interested with them coming up with their own meanings. I tell my kids every year that, you know, history is meaningful to people. What we talk about may not be meaningful to you, but by definition, if somebody's written about the past and tried to present it to us, they thought somehow it was either meaningful to them or meaningful to society at large. So, 
Building along that, um, games became a very important part of my educational process for my kids, uh, perhaps because I was a frustrated Dungeons and Dragons player that didn't have enough people to play with when I was 12, so now I'm taking it out on my kids. But I, I think really because what simulation games represent in the classroom is a representation of reality. And it is every bit as much a, well, usually a critically researched representation of reality as much as any paper or argument uh, um, in a book could be. We're almost here. So what becomes really important for me then is to have my kids look at simulation games um, from a very critical perspective. I think that simulation games are wonderful for building empathy. I think they're great for inspiring curiosity and love of learning on their own. Um, those aren't the uses that I'm most interested in. Um, I'm most interested in my kids taking sort of the, the gripping environment of a game and then saying, is that valid? At what point did the designer um, make decisions that were for gameplay or simplicity's sake? Um, there is no representation of reality, whether it's a book on history or a game like Civilization III that includes all of reality. That's not possible by definition. So what I try to have my kids do is say, okay, at what point does the game fit my understanding of the past? At what point does it not necessarily fit my understanding of the past? Um, what that requires then is having a counterpoint. I need them to have some other kind of historical source or sources that they can use to then critique um, the model that they're looking at in the game. So I'm going to tell you about two things that I've done, or two things um, that are going on here with Civilization III. One is the way that I've actually used it in my classroom. And then the other is the way that I'm going to be using it next year, sort of what I've learned from this and where I think I can go with it. Um, so I focus specifically on the pre-industrial world, probably A, because I'm an ancient historian, but B, because Civilization III is so grand in scope that I think for a teacher to try and use the whole thing, um, I, I think you can do it. It sounds like Patricia's done it by, I, I assume they did it on their own a lot of it, right? Sure. I can explain. Um, I actually had them play, at least play the first part of it in the classroom because what I found was that students would have a lot of questions about history that they would shout out if they knew I was there in the classroom, but they wouldn't make any effort to investigate later. So that I insisted that, you know, they play at least for 45 minutes to an hour uh, in the classroom with me there. And it was fascinating to find out sort of what things they didn't know and what they wanted to know. So. So I guess we take a similar approach to that, um, but I wanted to break it down for them and focus on something that I think the game does very well, which is simulate the pre-industrial world. Um, it, it's really critical, I think, if you're going to make some sense of where we are in, in, in the world and in the universe and in time, to realize the difference between pre-industrial and post-industrial. Um, I mean, just everything you think of and you take for granted, gosh, everything in this room didn't exist in the pre-industrial world. Um, it, it was just a different mindset, and I think the game does a very good job with that. So, um, where I tried this out was with a class I had designed on simulations in, uh, that I just, well, I'm finishing up uh, this second semester. Um, we were working on traditional simulation designs, um, pen and paper, cardstock, things like that. I, I would love it. I'm, I'm no slouch of a programmer. I could teach them to do some programming of simulations, but I don't think they have the skill sets really to come in from scratch and do that. So we were working really on traditional simulations as, as representations of the past where they, their final project was to research and develop one on their own. But I wanted them to play Civilization III for a good couple of weeks so that they could get a sense of how somebody can represent the past and what decisions you have to make when you're representing the past. So this is my classroom. Um, <laughs> The shot is actually staged because, of course, you only invited me about 10 days ago. See, these are the actual kids and the actual computers, but we played Civilization III about eight months ago or something like that, or six months ago. Well, you know, Kurt said he wanted to see my classroom, and I, yeah, so there you go. Um, so in any event, although actually I think the one plugging in his uh, computer on the back was playing Civ III at that point, so. So what I had them do at first is I had them read a book, uh, or not a book, I had them read large portions of a work by um, a scholar named Patricia Crone. It was called Pre-Industrial Societies. It came out about 
15 years ago, and I've yet to see anything like it as far as a really solid survey on what the pre-industrial world was like. Um, and, and then I had them go through and keep pretty detailed notes and sort of call out what they were observing and they were seeing along the way. Why were some things working? Why were, were some things not working? Um, and then we started in. I spent probably about an hour uh, teaching them how to play um, and then sort of set them loose in class to work on this on their own. Um, the learning curve was a little steep for some, but it was manageable. By the end, my 16 kids were able to play very well. And these were some of the observations they made. And I'll tell you about how they sort of showed that to me later on. Um, uh, they decided that, in fact, you know, Civilization III did a very good job showing that uh, pre-industrial society was mostly agrarian and rural. Um, they noted that, you know, agriculture was really important. The nice little weed icons that you see down in the bottom on the city screen under food, do, or bread icons, I guess, I always thought of them as wheat, um, do a really good job of showing the importance of, of agriculture to these early societies. But they were also on target uh, on the fact that in a society that's supposed to be 90% peasants in villages, there are no villages to be seen. So they said, wow, what do you know? I mean, we can see where agriculture is really important, but that aspect of, of, of reality is not there. And, you know, so we taught, had discussions about uh, game design versus, uh, uh, you know, historical reality. Very good job, they decided. Um, Civ 3 did a very good job talking about the dependence of cities on the surrounding hinterland. Um, and, and you can see that in the top right, you have a settler there that's about to found a city, and there's a city square radius around them, which, honestly, I don't know what you were thinking when you did that, Jeff, but I like to think you were thinking that that shows the city's dependence on the surrounding you know, countryside that it's going to have to exploit. So they thought that was a, a, a very good model as well. Um, there's still a lot of debate about the ancient city, but most people say that it was very much just sort of a leech that was taking in resources from the surrounding countryside. And again, my kids thought that was pretty accurate. And, and just to sort of make clear what's going on, um, just as I don't want them to read a textbook, I didn't want them to play Civ 3 and say, oh wow, that's how it was. So they're using this other uh, historical work to serve as a counterpoint and sort of balance the two out absolutely saw the limits on transportation and communication, right? You traveled by foot power or horsepower or water or wind power in the ancient world. Um, and that's pretty much the way of it in Civ III. Uh, it very slow moving around. And if you build roads, it gets a little faster. And they seized onto that as well. You know, they notice, you know, I mean, you get into an interesting thing about factors of time. 50 years pass for each term at the beginning. And, and my kids notice that, hey, it probably wouldn't take 50 years to walk through, you know, the hillside. But that's the point. It, a, a simulation, no representation of, of reality, no historical work is accurate in all details. We're all selective. And it's the very fact that you have to make a, a decision about how time should move in a game that gets my kids thinking about reality and how to deal with it. So, I, you know, were perfection a, a goal, I'd say don't try it. I mean, you know, just do the best you can here and then use it to start the dialogue. So that was great as well. And then just the impact of geography on cities. Um, I placed that particular city there. Um, if you pulled up the screen um, that would show you that city, you'd have a pretty difficult time feeding your population at that point. Um, the hills around don't provide much agriculture. Um, the plain lands are, are dry in the game, and so they produce a limited amount of food. But the irrigation squares, which are represented sort of to the uh, south and east of the city by those little blue lines, um, w um, those irrigation squares um, increase the uh, food production for the cities, and the kids seized onto that as well. And finally, this one they didn't seize on as much, but I thought it was a very good part of the game, is the scarcity of food and resources. I mean, people weren't lazy in the ancient world. They just had to spend all their time growing food. That's why it took so long to make everything else. Um, and, and I think that's very well represented. Um, so, again, you get into the time scale issues. That granary down in the bottom right will take another six years to build, or six turns, which is about 240 years in game time. Um, and those things are great. And you know what's nice about that, too, is it allows for some some real differential learning among the kids. I mean, that's something that, um, or not, that's not the appropriate term for it, but it allows kids of all different abilities and, and sort of mindsets to grasp onto something here and really think about what the game's representing. Because everybody could seize on the fact that 300 years to build a building was probably not likely, but not everybody grasped on all the other, you know, uh, elements of it. I had a, a, a student of mine who's still avidly playing uh, six months later come in yesterday and said something about, um, well, first of all, they asked me how to beat the game. Um, and so, 
I, I, I told him that the game seemed to reward obsessive compulsive settling of cities one after another until you were bigger than everybody else. I know this because I'm an infrastructure man and I really didn't like the fact that I had to keep sending out settlers. But once we moved on, he asked me about the United States as better builders and what I thought about that. And so we pulled up the starting scenarios and got into an interesting discussion about the uh, tribal characteristics of the different cultures. You can see there the Romans are militaristic and commercial, the English are commercial and expansionist, the Indians are commercial and religious and so on. And it got into an interesting question of um, to what extent is that, you know, is that based on a sense of ethnic characteristics? Is that meant to be a reflection of what had actually happened in history? Um, why were there only two for each group? Is that a gameplay issue? And it just became a very interesting discussion. We decided that it probably was reflecting a sense of the history of these civilizations more than anything else, but that it was also a gameplay issue as far as balancing them out. But the point is, these kinds of conversations have my kids fundamentally questioning how you represent reality. I believe that strongly. And that's why I think a game like this is, is incredibly valuable in, in a high school history classroom. Again, as, as a model to critique. Okay. So they summed it up with a paper, because hey, come on, I'm, I'm a history teacher. So um, they came up with this analysis paper. <laughs> well, <laughs> There, 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 are, there are many, but anyways. <laughs> so they came up with this. One could have easily done this in any number of different forms. The paper's not the only meaningful way you could assess something like this. But again, I wanted them to actively draw comparisons between um, the historical models that they had seen um, in Patricia Crone's survey work and the historical models they saw in Civilization Three. And the stuff that I had listed through before was what most of the papers centered around, the, the, the great ways that the game represents the importance of geography for settling cities, uh, the great ways that the game shows the limitations on, on building and feeding a population and things like that. Um, oh, one person did note, actually, one of, one of my uh, students did note that it's interesting that um, two other things, the elite are transparent um, in, 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 this, in this game. I mean, you're kind of the elite, so they're sort of missing. And the other thing is that the peasants, even though they're the bulk of society, one of my students was confused why there were like five heads down there, but then 60,000 people in the city and what the correlation was um, between the number of heads and, and, and the population. But again, I mean, these are just great questions to be asking. So that's where, that's where I was. Um, this is where I'm going next year with my ninth graders. We have a coordinated humanities program that's English and history and technology. And I'm going to set them loose on Civ 3 for a, a couple of weeks, I guess. Not in class. My plan is that I'll, I'll train them for an hour or two. And then what I'd like to do is, is have them sort of check in every so often um, in stages. So a couple of things. First of all, I, I think what you need to do is you have to create an evidence packet. I mean, that's just me. I'm a stickler about having uh, different sources of evidence that the kids can draw on. Um, it's hard in some senses with the pre-industrial world because we're talking about a broad swath of time. So you can't really read primary sources on it. You have to sort of gather the data, but it's there. You can look at the development of agricultural civilizations. Where are they going to develop? They're going to develop near water where you can farm exactly as the game would represent it. Um, you can look at grain yields that we have reasonably good ideas of, of yields of grain um, you know, that are all around. You, know, you plant one unit and you get five or six back. And you see that in the game as well until you get um, refrigeration and, and, and uh, modern uh, agriculture in the Civ 3 game, you, you really don't produce a lot of food. Okay? I would then have them define a set of characteristics for pre-industrial societies. This is all prep work before they've played the game. Then learn to play the game. Again, it's about 50 minutes to an hour, and then you have the kids come in for extra help who need a little more background on that. And keep an observation journal. What did you try? What happened when you did this? Why did this work? Why did that not work? Why did you get crushed within the first you know, five turns of your game? You know, what could you have done differently to avoid that? And then use that to have an active critique. Does this match up with your sense of how history worked? All right, I'm going to move on. Um, but I want to make this last point. Ultimately then, by doing all that, they're doing the work of a historian. They're saying, I see this model in my sources. I see this model in Civilization Three. I accept one, I accept the other. Maybe I don't accept either, and I form my own idea of what the past was like. But they form their own representations of the past. They find something that's meaningful for them, and, and that's really all I would ever want for my kids. 
The other thing I, I, that I definitely want to do is focus on geography. I mean, S Civilization Three uh, uh, teaches the importance of geography very, very well. So I was using the scenario editor and coming up with a map of Greece the other day, um, and I just wanted to focus on a couple of things. One, you can see there are a lot of hills. It's very rugged. Down at the bottom, if you look at all those sort of outline boundaries, um, those are the boundaries of different civilizations. So I planted different Greek city-states where they would be roughly, and they're all basically on top of each other. I played it a few times, and you get crushed pretty quickly. But it's a great way to have the kids play and then think about the conflict that was endemic among the Greek uh, city-states. So my hope is I train them, and then a couple of weeks before we start the unit on Greece, I say, okay, start playing this, this scenario, keep an observation log, make sure you have it done by this date, and then let's get into the class together and discuss what you've observed. I just wanted to show you a blow-up of... Oh, I'm sorry. This is just stuff I'd covered before. And so that's a blow-up of the screen that they're seeing. So that's it. Thank you. Is, is this the mic you're using? Yeah, we're All right, just now. Just I'll shift to this. Oh, you're on top of it. Great. Uh, all right. Well, we've got about um, 10 minutes for questions. And so um, we can, Nick's got the roving mic here. Great. Go pick one. Is my time OK? Yeah. This isn't so much a question as a comment. Uh, you seem to be a bit apologetic about writing reports. And it occurred to me that we need, we need an overlay in this civilization, maybe civilization 2000 and or 21st century or something like that. We could have a frame, an epistemic frame, to take a term from the last uh, session, uh, involving writing reports as opposed to cultivating land. Reminds me that uh, the Commission on Paperwork produced more paperwork than it eliminated. <laughs> and we need a simulation on bureaucratic life. I guess that is a comment, not yeah. a question, so we're yeah. going. <laughs> but a provocative one. <laughs> yeah. uh, the question that I have is, um, did any of you try using Civ as a multiplayer game? And if so, what were the changes in dynamics that you saw versus uh, using it as a single player game? I, I have in after school settings, and I found there was a, a, a f about maybe 25% of the kids who were like, ah, they're kind of into the game, they liked it, but then all of a sudden they were just way, way into it. And the only thing I would uh, say, if you're using at least Civ, probably other games, I think it's particularly true of Civilization. If you've played multiplayer, then you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's pretty intense. I mean, I, I had to make sure we had a place to go, like, if you lost, because it, it's, it's very, <laughs> it's a very personal experience. I mean, you can imagine building a Civilization over eight, you know, eight, tw 20, 25 hours, and then some went, so it's like playing the Diplomacy with friends or sift through the board game is the same way. Like you, I, I was dealing you know, with, with uh, poor kids, um, who, many of whom had a lot of, you know, who, who would go haul off and hit people. I don't know if that's in social class. Like, I don't know. I don't go there. But anyway, people d did, we did have to watch because like things like fighting breaking yeah. out. So it was, uh, but the engagement went way up and you certainly had people then also very motivated to figure out what's going on. Um, losing is, is it certainly a big motivating factor um, be behind learning here, which has come up a couple of times. It's really interesting that in any game-based model or most game-based models, you're going you're to have to see things like um, losing, trying again, being very core, you know, drivers of, of learning. And in most school-based situations, that's, you know, failing isn't really good and people think they've already lost, you know, the moment they fail. But Could I just add something yeah. to that? Um, I just want to say that uh, Age of Empires, uh, when you do it multiplayer, you lose all the historical information. And unfortunately, that was uh, a big reason not to do that as a multiplayer. I did it once and that was the end of that. I think Kurt uh, shared with me experiences about the um, interactive uh, things that happen with the game when kids are just 20 kids are playing in a room, and I actually think that that's a really interesting take on multiplayer. Yeah. You know, about the yelling back and forth and the values they have. I don't know if you want to talk about that the, for a sec. Well, the other thing too that's interesting is that even when the kids are playing single player games, they're they're also somewhat playing multiplayer games because you find that kids are are both comparing 
um, in two games. So if three kids are all playing as Egypt, comparing how's your game versus mine versus yours. And then also as they start, say they're getting beat as Egypt because they, they are finding that's crowded because of all the ancient civilizations. Oh, I should go play as the Iroquois. So they go run over and look at some kid who's been playing, or like say as the Aztecs. They look at the kid who's been playing the Aztecs and they say, um, hmm, there's no global trade network that they're really a part of and I don't, maybe I don't want to play that. So the, it, they very much turned it into multiplayer games even when single player. But yeah, the, the kind of talk that emerges around games, I, I think is a very interesting, just as I guess was in, uh, Mimi mentioned the opening panel, uh, I find it's an incredibly social experience, much more than what they normally do in school. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Russell Francis from Oxford University. I, I was very interested in the last presentation, particularly on the emphasis you put on getting the kids to critically c frame and compare. But it seemed to me that what is and that's when it becomes educational, it seems to me. But you, as a teacher, are absolutely fundamental in that process. So what concerns me is what happens when Civ is played independently without a teacher or perhaps a, a researcher there to encourage them to then discuss and reflect. Does it remain an educational activity in that context? Because my, I, I question that, because I think there's enormous room there for us to um, form misconceptions that go unchecked. And I, I'd be yeah. interested in what the panel thought of that. Well, I, I agree with you completely. I mean, I think the, the role of an active, thoughtful teacher is, is essential in the classroom. I think, you know, it, it's easy to you know, go from saying we shouldn't be lecturing all the time to suddenly saying we shouldn't be there, and that's not really what should be happening. I guess my sense is that I, I would seriously do one of two things, either either make it impossible for my kids to play and experience the game in any sort of lengthy fashion, or kill it for them if I tried to make sure that every time I was, I was uh, having them play the game, I was monitoring it. So for me, what becomes critical then is to, to debrief, is to make sure that they're keeping an observation log. And, and I would say the same thing's true when I'm having my kids read primary sources. I mean, you know, they have guided reading questions. They come back the next day, we work in groups, and then together as a large class to really go through and, and nitpick what the sources say and what you can say about the past based on them. So at, at that point, I'm trying to offer for some scaffolding for them. So uh, I guess I would agree with you that misconceptions could form about the past playing on your own. But I, I think the same could be uh, said of any material that you're reading or processing. And, and the role of the, essential of, the, of the teacher is to make sure that they're there periodically checking in um, and, and having open discussion about what the kids are observing, what they think is going on, what you think is going on, and sort of forming a dialogue on it. I, did, did, you, did you play much on your own? Did you play Civilization or SimCity by chance in your own, Russell? Did, uh, what, did, uh, what, what did you think? Were you concerned about your own misconceptions or? No, but, uh, I'm curious, I meant somewhat tongue in cheek because you find a lot of people, especially with SimCity, I think there's a lot of people who said, well, I'm nervous those other people, like I figure out what's going on, but those other people <laughs> aren't going to. And I, I'm, I, mean, I didn't mean it quite as probably as accused her, I'm sorry about that. But um, I, I guess I mean it to say that there's a lot of times I think around this where I agree that you want people building interpretations within a community of inquiry of some sort where they can um, ju balance their justifications off of others. This is actually something I'm writing about right now with one of my students looking at the, the civ communities online, because they really are some really robust communities online where they do draw historical interpretations. And right now in particular, you see a lot of arguing around global politics um, as they m could potentially be represented in a game. So for example, there's a group in uh, Politan.net that's looking at cultural imperialism and they're arguing you know, whether or not the United States, if you're going to design a current political political mod, you know, what would the how would you look at some of the say, pl recent political moves and so on? So I think if you actually look at what most game players do, I think you, you tend to find they, they, they are in pretty robust, um, they have a pretty robust kind of arguing community and there is a, a pretty big diversity of, of, of opinions that are present. present sorry. But. Um, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we found, we've gotten letters uh, uh, like from a group in Canada that wanted us or somebody to create um, a mod to demonstrate the history of, Ca of Canada. Um, and before we got those letters, we created uh, an expansion pack called Conquests, uh, which has historical scenarios, or you know, our attempt at, at doing historical scenarios, and you know, we found that those to be re re really a lot of fun. Was wondering if you, any of you have used 
the, the conquests in your teaching? I've played it. I haven't used it in my teaching. I, you I haven't did. It was played just... it? <laughs> no, I, I had a lot of fun playing it. I kept losing, but I played it. I, I, I used it. I found for the kids, I was using it was so specific and so historically specific that it was mostly 6th and 7th graders. It's just the language and everything was really tough. Um, it, it was really impressive, though. I mean, it's the historical specificity that it gets at there, I think, is really powerful and it's worth looking at. Uh, Michael Nitsch, Georgia Tech. Just a short question, uh, organizational question for Pat. I, I remember how long it took me to beat Age of Empires 1 and 2 and looking at Civ 1. How do you do this in a curriculum? Uh, or, or do the kids, because part of the game is that it rewards you after 10 hours of gameplay. There has to be still something that keeps you playing. That's part of how games are constructed. They don't give you everything up front. So you have to somehow make sure that they get everything, don't they? Um, yeah, it, what's interesting is that I have a, a slightly different approach to learning. In other words, what I'm interested in is what sticks with the students. In other words, I'm interested in the kinds of knowledge that they are attracted to because that's the kind of knowledge that they're likely to remember once they get out of the classroom, once they graduate from the university. Um, and I found students being, different students were enthralled and they're not, they're not divided by gender, by national origin. Some were absolutely fascinated by civilizations. Some couldn't wait for the session to end. It was the same thing with Age of Empires. It was the same thing with almost every game that we played. In other words, that there were some people, they would spend hours in their room um, and say that I was a detriment to their other education. Um, and there were a fair number of people that would say, well, yeah, no, I've learned about, I learned enough about this. Let's go on to the next one. And so we had a project we, where we did, you know, different ones every week so that, you know, you had a week to learn whatever it was you were going to learn out of that. And then they had quizzes, historical quizzes on, on each of those games, which were more about the kinds of learning that they were doing. And then the structure of the course was around creation of games. In other words, that the end of the semester, you had to have created your own game with an original game mechanism. And I think that's what distinguishes teaching this at the university level from teaching it at the high school um, and elementary and middle school levels. In other words, that you have to think not only about the history, but about the mechanism that you're going to create to play the game, so. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thanks again to all of our panelists. And